My name is Mahendra Velade Pillai. Uh, this is a joint talk with uh, Bala Kalyana Sundaram. Um, basically, our talk was supported by two families. Bala was supported by Crave's family. I was supported by McBride family and also supported in part by NSF. NSF is the National Science Foundation. We have to mention them because they support us and they give us money for travel and our salaries and everything. So big thank you to all of them. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about this topic. Uh, this is not an electrical engineering talk. It's a computer science talk. Specifically, it's an algorithms talk. And more specifically, it's random algorithms, distributed computing, and communication complexity. So it's all computer science, OK? Thank you. So the first thing is, I have to define what a sensor network is, and a sensor, and so on and so forth. So let's get started. So sensor and a sensor node, by definition, sensor is an electronic device that measures a physical quantity and converts it into a signal which can be read by any observer or an instrument. I mean, you all know what a sensor is. I'm 100% sure all of you have a sensor in your pocket. How many people don't have a phone? See, all of you have one. There are many sensors in your phone, okay? Apple has something like 23 sensors now, the newest one, all kinds of sensors. Uh, a sensor node is a basic unit in the sensor network. I'll tell you what a sensor network is, okay? And usually what happens is this, okay? A wireless sensor network is where we're gonna focus uh, talk today. Uh, it's basically a bunch of sensor nodes put together, and they somehow communicate, and uh, obviously wirelessly, and they kind of establish some kind of a rhythm as to cooperate. Okay, so that's and then somehow there's some base station or satellite or something which takes the information from these nodes. So in this particular example, what happens is if this detects something, it kind of transmits it through this, and this guy gets it. This is one model, okay? There are many models like this. There are, as far as I'm concerned, thousands of them. Here's another one, okay? Uh, basically, what the military does is, what they do is they go and throw a whole bunch of sensor nodes somewhere, uh, and they want to detect, say, tank movements or something like that and they drop them from the air, or they do something they won't tell you. And then basically, these automatically organize themselves. And then basically, they detect something, and then they transmit, and somebody can make decisions based on what the uh, nodes have told them. So this happens, actually, OK? And um, the next one is basically the major applications. Notice. I'm only putting the major ones here, and I'll tell you the importance of why these are really major, okay? The forest fire detection. Uh, you should know right now, the Amazon is burning. Amazon produces 20% of the world's oxygen. There are millions of acres of, uh, forests, have of uh, forests have burned now. And in California in 2018, California only, there are more than 50,000 acres caught fire. But the damage there was much more simply because it also destroyed residences. Uh, this is also very important. Obviously, water is the most basic thing for us, right? These days, in the US, there's all kinds of uh, things happening. They do what's called fracking for oil. By the way, US is the biggest exporter of petroleum products now. So they do all kinds of digging, and they pump water into it, take the oil out, and all the water is contaminated, groundwater. So they have to really monitor this out. It's really crazy, actually, some places. Uh, landslide detection, it's you in Sri Lanka. I've seen many, many landslides in the recent past, okay? Uh, this is becoming very important because they say pretty soon there won't be any drivers, it'll be all uh, driverless cars. So a lot of sensors are in there, too. And then this is, this is where the money is. If you can talk something with the military about sensors, they give you money. Yeah, that's what they do. So military applications. Uh, fire detection, um, basically what you do is you have sensors. There are many sensors that can detect gases, temperatures, all kinds of sensors. And if you use them correctly, what they can do is send an alarm, and then you can go put the fire off. So think about this. If you catch the fire early, you can put it off very quickly. If you don't, basically, if you know this pi r squared, 
when the R increases by one, the area doubles kind of. So the fire spreads pretty quickly. So it's easy to catch it early and then put it off. And it's very important now, it's crazy right now. The air pollution is the same way, okay, because these days I travel around a little bit. Wherever you go to, whatever city you go to, the pollution is really bad. It's not only in Colombo, you go to Thailand, you go to Chennai, you go to Washington DC, you go to New York, California, anywhere the pollution is bad. And at least in the US what they do is they warn us. They have all these sensors everywhere. Uh, in the old days, somebody has to go, they have to measure and then warn. These days they have sensors everywhere. And early morning you get a report saying oh, the air quality is bad, don't go out, don't exercise, things like that. And it's actually good because what happens is when you breathe, the air goes directly into your lungs. At least when you drink water, that's a filtration system called the kidney. So this is really bad, actually. Uh, the next one is water quality monitoring. And I told you, in the US, it's pretty bad now. I don't know about Sri Lanka. In the US, it's really, really getting bad because with the new administration, they have relaxed all the regulations. So everybody goes and digs everywhere and gets oil and gas out and contaminate the groundwater. Uh, landslide, same thing, and kind of basically uh, what you do is you put sensors in there, in the places where you think there's going to some uh, landslide is going to happen, and then depending on the moisture content and the land movement and so on and so forth, you can predict it and you can save lives. So I'm not going to go through this, there are many of them, okay? Uh, military surveillance is another one. I told you, they throw a whole bunch of sensors and uh, it can detect pressure. So basically what they want to measure is or detect is tank movements. If the tank is moving, then you know that there's a big track or big set of sensors that can detect what happened there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, update available, that's, that's Bill Gates for you. <laughs> Bill Gates does that all the time. Even when I'm teaching, it pops up. And sometimes it reboots itself. That's why you use Apple. Use Apple, it doesn't do that actually. Anyways, no, I'm serious. Yeah, we don't use Microsoft much anymore. So anyway, this is that. So I'm gonna just, uh, just go through this. So here's some of the examples. Let me tell you about this. This one, I saw this, okay, with my own, uh, when I was driving down Washington, not Washington, DC, from Washington to New York, and I was passing a bridge. It's a fairly big bridge, and I saw some thing was banging on one end of the bridge. Bang, bang. I was like, what the hell is going on? When I went to the other side, they have a whole bunch of sensors. So basically, they were listening to cracks on the bridge. Okay, so depending on the vibration, they can detect and then they can go proactively fix it in advance. They don't have to measure it all the time or examine it all the time. Uh, the rest, I just keep, okay? There are many, many applications. Uh, medicine and healthcare, I mean, these days, they are putting sensors into your body, okay? Uh, they put chips in to measure whether breast cancer, or breast tumor is expanding or not, and so on and so forth. This is true because I know them. And let's go. So this is where I begin. So this is the model that we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about, this is an algorithm talk. In algorithms, basically what happens is we don't talk about n or the number of the input being very small. Usually, we are interested in when the input is very large and see whether it scales and what kind of a performance we get and so on and so forth. Is it okay? Yeah? So that's a model now to begin with. So n is large. So basically, we are assuming that we have millions of nodes. Nodes mean sensors, okay? So the idea here is we have large number of sensors and each node knows n. That means when you're manufacturing the sensor, so imagine a military, what they want to do is throw some sensors somewhere. So they will hire some contractor and say, hey, make these sensors. And they'll, by the way, uh, they really do this. And they want these sensors to be cheap because if there are millions and millions of nodes, even if a sensor costs one dollar, it's million dollars. So they have to be very careful with cost. So each node knows n. That you can hardwire, okay? You can say when you manufacture, manufacture the sensors, and if he's going to manufacture 10 million sensors, he can input that in, okay? That's the number of nodes. Uh, difficult to control exact location of each sensor. Obviously, you can't 
deploy three million sensors and go putting it in each location. That's stupid, yeah? Uh, individually programming each node is impractical. So this is critical. You can hardwire some of this stuff. I'll explain what you mean by individually programming each node. Basically, when you throw these nodes, they're going to stay in some place. You don't know where they are. And if they want to interact with the environment, you can't program that, OK? You have to, you have to let the node decide, understand where they are to co communicate. I'll explain that to you later on. I'll show you, OK? A node cannot transmit and receive information simultaneously. This is our model. It's half duplex, not full duplex. Why is it? We want the nodes to be as cheap as possible. That way you can throw in more nodes, yeah? OK, that's the idea. Uh, this one is a little tricky. So basically, when you have a node, we assume that the transmission radius in the radius R. Technically, if you speak to these engineers, they'll say there is something called a listening range and a noise range and so on and so forth. We're not worried about that. In fact, we can model that. It's not a big deal. That doesn't change much. So here, we're going to assume that if you have a node, there's a radius R around which the other nodes can listen. If the node is outside that range, it can't listen. Is that OK? That's critical for us, yeah? Uh, so that's what this means. Each node has a transmission range R, and any node within the range can receive information from this node. Each node has bounded number of neighbors. What the hell that, that means? Basically, if you have a node, there's some number, like 10 or 20, neighbors maximum, that's all, yeah? You don't have infinite number of neighbors. That's a reasonable assumption. So all these assumptions are very reasonable, OK? This one is, you can argue with me, but it's not a big deal, OK? Any questions so far about the model? Hello. You should talk to me. How many students are here? Put your hands up, please. You should come forward. Come on. Because we are going to do this together, OK? Come, come. It's OK. Come on, get up. Come. Kasun. Thanks. Give me one second. I dropped something here. OK, we went back. So here's a question for you, OK? The question for you is, Not that one. What do we want? So you have a whole bunch of nodes, right? So what do we want? What we want is the nodes to communicate with each other. Yes? Get that? Yes? The next one is so each sensor node must communicate with its neighbors without interference. So in other words, you're sitting there, and you want to talk to him. And when you, so we go here. I'll point it at the feet. So she's sitting there, OK? And you want to talk to her. So when you talk to her, he shouldn't talk to her, right? There'll be interference. Yes or no? Yeah? So if you have a lot of neighbors, so the person behind, if he wants to talk, the other people around him shouldn't talk, right? And when he talks, if the other people don't talk, then the people around him can listen. Is that OK with you or not? Yeah? That's the idea, OK? For each node, the time between two successive transmission slots should be minimum. In other words, now notice you guys want to talk to each other. So when you talk, other people around you shouldn't talk. So you can do this. You can take today, talk today. He can talk tomorrow. He can talk the next day. That's stupid, yeah? So we want to, the gap between communication minimum, yes? Yes or no? Come on, talk to me. Any questions? So that's the key point, yeah? So to do this, there are many models, OK? 
Uh, these are the three major models. This is called the medium access control protocols. So this is basically protocol talk, random access protocol talk. And the way it works is basically you can have what's called fixed assignment. I can say you talk at 12, you talk at 1, you talk at 2, like those are fixed assignments. The other one is demand assignments. You're going to tell me, I have to talk at 1 o'clock. Oops. Yeah? <laughs> and you say, I want to talk at 1.30, right? Then I have to somehow find an assignment. Yes, that's demand assignment. The other one is random access. Yes? What do you think is the best out of all this? It depends on the problem. Yes? You can't decide. Yes? It depends on the problem, what you want to do. So for us, what we're going to do is, if you look at this, we have all these nodes. We have no idea where they are. Somehow they have to figure out how to communicate. So here is the time. The time goes like this. And time is split into slots, yes? Usually, uh, depending on the sensor node, the slots can be long in microseconds or milliseconds or something like that. But we don't care. We know there are slots, yes? So basically, we have slots. And basically, what we want to do is we want to say, hey, you, you talk in this slot. Next one, you talk in this slot. Next one, you talk in this slot. And once we do all that, everybody should be able to communicate to everybody. Yes? Hello? You got that? Yes? So how would you do this? Guess. It doesn't matter. Just take a guess. If you make a mistake, that's fine. Let's do it together, OK? Think about it. So what would you do? So like, pretend you all are here. Right? All of you are here. You want to talk to each other. Right? The only thing is, when you talk, somebody else shouldn't talk. Yes? So how would you do that? What kind of an idea would you have? Say it again. Have a mediator. Very good. Very good. So basically, uh, he's behind, behind. Yeah. If you ask a question, you get a chocolate. Yeah? Uh, answer a question, you get two chocolates. <laughs> all right, so, so here's the problem. He says, have a mediator. Uh, these are all nodes that we throw in, yes? If you can have a mediator, that's a great idea, but we can't here, right? We don't, right? These are military ghosts like to Afghanistan or something like that, Afghanistan border, just throw them in and they go away. You can't put mediators there, they get killed, yeah? So it's a tough question, actually. So basically, what we're going to do is this is the establishing communications. Use random access to establish fixed slot assignments. Okay. So basically, the idea is this. We have to somehow find fixed slot assignments. The way we do this is using some random access. I want to explain that to you. And then when we do this, we won't get the best. In other words, when we first do this as random access, It'll say today, tomorrow, day after, like that. That's too much, right? So, but once we get that, that's the first step. Then we compress it to make it better. Is it OK? Yeah. So here is, uh, usually when you do research, you have to go look at the literature, OK? Otherwise, you're screwed. Because you do all the work and go and try to publish it. They'll say, you idiot, somebody has done it already. So you have to go back and look. So our work is this. This was the closest. It was done by Gandhi and Prasa Sarathi or some guy like that. And it chooses what's called graph coloring or CD coloring. And it's a very complicated algorithm. Okay? And they do this. And the difference between them and us is uh, we use what's called, you guys familiar with Bigo? Yes or no? Yeah. Bigo, for the people who don't know what that is, it's, it's Log n is, n is the number of nodes. Basically, we always talk about log 2. It doesn't really matter when it's big O. It's some constant time to log n. It's kind of the dominating factor is log n. This is big O mean there's some constant here. Yeah? So the random bits they use is log squared n. n is the number of nodes. We use that. And then the number of transmissions they use is log squared n. We use log n. So we beat them here. We beat them here. And then bits transmitted per node, because nodes have to transmit to establish communication. Uh, and then number of steps, that's the only place where we are equal. Yes? Is it OK? So this is the literature. Don't worry about this. So I'm going to do this. I'll show you. And then you tell me 
how I got this, okay? All right. So here's a protocol. Look at this. This is one step. So each node is hardwired to do this. You get that? Yes, each node has this program. So the way it works is, listen to this very carefully. This is pretty cool. P is a probability, yeah? So it's between 0 and 1. Is that OK? And then you toss a bias coin where probability for the, probability for the head is P. Obviously, the tail is 1 minus P, yes? I'm going to ask you a question now. How do you make a bias coin with probability P 0.1? So P is, say, 0.1. How would you make a bias coin? Come on! OK, if P is 0.1, what is 1 over P? What is 1 over P? 10, yes? So what you do is you take 10 random numbers, pick a favorite number. What do you want? 1 through 10. What do you want soon? What? 3 here. OK. So you pick 3. So you have 1 through 10. You pick a random number. If it is 3, then what you do is you transmit. Yeah? Anything else? You listen. How simple can this be? We should give this to the parliament. Yeah? You transmit, you all shut up and listen. Look at this. Can it be simpler than that? So you toss a coin, right? According to her, heads is three. If three comes, you transmit. Otherwise, you shut up and listen. Yeah? Yes or no? Pretty cool? Yes? So this is the protocol. Now what we have to do is we have to show that this works. Yeah? That means we have to show that when these guys run this protocol, eventually there will be slots for each node such that when each node gets its turn, there won't be any interference and they'll be able to communicate with their neighbors. Yes? And basically each node will have some slots saying, hey, I'm going to transmit. When it transmits, all the neighbors will receive them. Yes, are you following me or not? That's the idea. Okay. So any questions so far? Hmm? Good? You guys can do this, actually. So work with me. You can do it. Okay. Uh, so here's the definition. Basically, what this means is very simple. Okay. If one node doesn't get the necessary information, or I can't see all what it says is, if after running the protocol to establish communication, we say any sensor node is unsuccessful if it fails to receive information from its neighbors. Because what time is it? How many more minutes do I have? How many more minutes do I have? One hour? How, how much have I spent so far? I spent half an hour now? Oh, so, yeah, give me, give me, yeah. There's no clock. See, you guys should get a clock. There's no clock here. Uh, what am I supposed to do? Yeah? All right. So here's the theorem. See, right away we go to the theorem. So I told you this is an algorithms talk. OK? We have a simple protocol. And what we have to do is we have to show that once you run this protocol for some particular time, that's why we need the N, we are all going to be good. Isn't that great? And think of the protocol. It's very simple. And you can think of many different protocols like that. So why is a random protocol used other than the other one like what you said? It's simply because we don't know what to do. There's nothing else we can do. But they are just thrown in. Right? So here's, this is a funny number. I'll tell you what this number is. Don't worry about that number, OK? It's just we call it B. I'm going to call it C. So P is that probability, OK? So let P be a positive real in the range of 0, 1. And this is the probability. So here is the theorem. It's beautiful. Suppose n sensor nodes are uni uniformly distributed on a line. So what we're going to do is the following, OK? We're going to start very simple. So let's look at a straight line and assume these nodes are like this. Now, this is not a joke, or it's not a made-up problem. Um, if you drive down Pennsylvania Avenue, this is where the White House is. Every 10 yards, there's a camera. And you drive past it, your car, they take the picture of your car, and they have it for years and years and years. Okay? So these are all cameras and sensors, actually. So first, we look at a line. Okay? This is the line, and line topology. And basically, this is what we're going to do. Okay? Assume omnidirectional transmission. What it means is 
if you have a node here, when it transmits, this guy can get it, and this guy can get it, the neighbors, yes? Not the neighbors, neighbors. Yeah, that's the assumption. We all agreed on that one. That's what the radius R was about. And basically what we're saying is this, okay? Uh, signal reaches both neighbors on the line, that's what I told you. After C2 log n, I haven't told you what C2 is, but some constant. I'll tell you what it is pretty soon. Log n is, n is the number of nodes, okay? Uh, steps, so you go, suppose log n is 1,000 and C2 is 10 or something like that. After 10,000 steps, that is, you transmit, listen, transmit, or toss a coin. If it's heads, you transmit. Otherwise, listen, toss a coin. After 10,000 steps, we say everything is cool. Everybody can talk to each other. Okay, that's what we're saying here. After C2 log n steps, probability that there exists an unsuccessful sensor is at most 1 over n of d. That means everybody, this is very low number, because if n is a million, and if I choose d to be two, it's n squared or million squared, that's a very low number. And d is any fixed constant, I'll tell you what d is. Now look at this very carefully, okay? I want you to look at this very carefully, and if you're doing a problem like sorting, okay? Basically, this is what happens. When you sort, you pick your favorite sort, like heap sort or something like that, it's big O of n log n, you with me? So when n increases, what happens? n log n goes up, right? The curve goes up like this, yes? What the hell is happening over here? When n increases, this, this one goes down, isn't it? Hello? You think about that. So what the hell is going on? Remember, whenever you read a theorem, don't just read it, think about it. Okay? There's always an intuition behind it. Very good intuition, okay? All right? Th the reason for this is this. So this is where I'm trying to do your writing part. Let's see whether it works. So basically what you have is you have nodes like this. So supposed to choose a pen, and then you have nodes like this, right? Many, 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 many nodes like this. Notice here, when these guys are trying to figure out what to do, they have no impact on these guys, isn't it? Yeah? Like when you guys are talking to each other here, the people at the back, they can talk to each other, they won't interfere with you, isn't it? Yeah? So basically the thing is more localized, yes? And this is what you mean by distributed computing. So when N goes up, see the, you guys, even if you have a billion people, the effect of you talking to each other is localized, yes? So when n goes up, this goes up. Yeah? But you predict, so it doesn't, it won't affect you locally, yes? So that's what it says, yeah? So basically when we was made this theorem, usually you don't just come up with the theorem, you do something and then you come to prove something and then you figure out what the hell is going on, then you think about it, then it makes sense. If it doesn't make, something is wrong, yeah? Okay, that's what the first part is. And then the number of steps, T O L P means transmission or listen. Needed to, so that the expected number is this much. Basically what he's saying is the following, okay? Um, after this many steps, okay? Number of steps, this many steps, N is the number of nodes, B is this B. I'll, this is the reason we did that. I explained that B to you. After this many steps, we are, everybody has, okay, everybody is communicating, okay? So that's the theorem. So how do you prove this? Okay. So far, what have I done? I haven't done any computer science except the protocol. Simple protocol, yes? The rest is all mathematics. This is, I don't know where you guys learn this recurrence relation, this is recurrence relations. All what we do is, write this recurrent relation, there's some probability in there, and then we drive it through and we get the answer, I'll show you. So we'll only do for this one, for the higher ones, I will not go through the mathematics. I'll try to go through the mathematics here. So the first thing is, you know what this is? What is this? So I'll explain that to you, okay? So basically this number, this guy here, if you have a node here, 
if you have an ODM, for him to get information from the neighbors, what he has to get is he should shut up, he should shut up, and this guy can talk. That's P times. So P is the probability that this guy talks. This guy has to shut up, so it's 1 minus P. Pardon me, I can't write this pen, is not good. And the probability that this guy doesn't talk is 1 minus P. So that's P times 1 minus P squared. Or this guy talks and these two guys shut up, yes? So when you add them up, it's two, yes? You get that? Is it okay? So basically, if you have a node in the middle, either both, for him to get the information from both guys, okay, he should shut up, he should shut up, and this guy transmits, or he should shut up, this guy shuts up, and this guy transmits, yes? This is the, or the probability theory, yes? So that's how you get this number. That's the probability of the sensor node successfully receiving information from one of its neighbors, yes? Okay? Now notice, and that's what alpha we call. What is one minus alpha? One minus alpha is the probability that he doesn't get any information from his neighbors, yes? So this is saying, the definition of this is basically saying, very careful, we only have i is two because two neighbors, k is the number of steps. The probability that the sensor node successfully received information from exactly i neighbors. So basically here it's one or two neighbors, right? Later on we'll generalize it, that's why we start off with this. So basically this is the definition which says the probability that after k steps a node gets information from exactly i neighbors, yes? So this is basically saying the probability that <coughs> nobody, okay, right? This is no nodes, exactly i neighbors means no neighbors after k step. So you're sitting here, after k steps you have not received anything, yes? This is the probability of receiving, one minus is not receiving, after k steps there are independent probabilities, so you multiply them, you get k, yeah? I'm teaching you probability, I'm sorry about that. I just want to make it clear, yeah? And then R1K, the recurrence relation is basically saying this is the probability of getting information from one node. So I'm sitting here, I either get from this guy or this guy, exactly one, yes? That's what it says. So how does that work? You get zero up to K minus one steps and get one, that's what that is, yes? Or you get one information before k minus one steps and get nothing. What is nothing? Alpha over two is the uh, one guy shouldn't transmit. So if you got one already, the next guy shouldn't transmit, that's one minus alpha over two. You got that or no? It's not that difficult actually. This is simple probability theory and recurrence relation, okay? You guys can actually do this. It's not a big deal. So basically once we have that, notice, how did I get this? Notice this guy here is zero k minus one. So if I plug in a k minus one, this is k minus one. So this is this k minus one. This guy here is this, yeah? And this alpha is alpha. And the rest remains the same. Now what I do is I, I can iterate on this and solve this. I'll show that to you, but I won't spend much time on this. And this is zero. This is saying after zero step, you cannot get any communication, yes? So it's probably zero. This is for one. This is for two. So why am I doing this? Because I want to prove that after some number of steps, I told you what the number of steps was, is C2 log n, I would have had communications from all my neighbors, yes? So this is the probability that I have all the communication from both neighbors after k steps. I have to find k, and the k better be C2 log n. Yes? So that's where I'm heading towards, okay? So basically, this is the recurrence relation. What this says is, hey, after k steps, I want to get both my neighbors to talk to me. That's the same as one guy talks to me up to k minus n steps, and the k step, the last guy talks to me. That's alpha over two, yeah? Or both the guys have talked to me up to k minus one steps, yes? And now what we have, and this is, again, the boundary condition which says, uh, Two guys cannot talk to me in one step, yeah? So that's zero. Now all what I do is stupid mathematics, okay? Believe it or not, I was going to show it to you, but I can't show it to you because Kasun says I'm out of time, right? <laughs> oh, I have time. I have one hour, right? 30 minutes gone already. I haven't done anything. Uh, so basically what you do is you, you kind of expand this, okay? It's pretty easy to expand this. Now notice you have this equation. 
So this is k minus one. So you do another recurrence relation. Yes, you have done this or not? Have you guys done this? Yeah? Yes or no? Tell me. Yes? How come you guys don't let them talk? Why don't they talk? In my class, if I ask one question, there'll be 20,000 questions. So why don't you talk? Why are you afraid? You should talk. You should ask questions. Question everything. Don't believe. You can, I'm not saying people lie, but think and question everything, okay? Don't be afraid. We're not gonna yell at you, yeah? I want you to learn, because when I'm old, you're gonna take care of me, yeah? Okay, so, um, all what I do is, I just, this one here, I can do one K minus one, so it'll be K minus two, and I plug it in back, and so on and so forth, I solve it. So basically what happens is, I end up with this, yeah? And this is your simple summation. You can figure it out, it's not that difficult. By the way, this paper is published, it's online somewhere, you can check it out, all these details. And then, when you see, this is your high school, remember one plus a plus a r square, a squared plus a cubed, that equation, you get this, yeah? So you have to believe me, I'm not gonna waste time on this one, yeah? Is it okay? Yeah? So now, I'm heading towards this, okay? I wanna get this guy, yeah? This is, oops, I'm going forward. I wanna go backwards. So I, I really want this guy, because I wanna show that eventually R2 of K, uh, after K steps, and my, I wanna find what K is, uh, and I wanna say that R2 of K becomes one or something like that, okay? So anyways, then I do the same thing for this. I can solve it, it's very easy to solve it, oops. It's very easy to solve, okay, because basically once, see R2 of K is this, so once you solve this, you plug this back in here and then solve it. That's all I'm doing, okay? So we do this and we end up with this, yeah? You believe that? If you don't believe that, I'm sorry, but this mathematics is stupid mathematics, just algebra and so on and so forth. So let me tell you a story, this is a true story. Um, when I was here, uh, there was no computer science and I was doing mathematics. So then somebody was telling, my girlfriend actually, oh, this guy is horrible because he's doing mathematics, there's no scope. Whoever who said that is stupid, okay? Mathematics is really important. Look at this, all what I did was one little protocol. The rest is all mathematics and statistics, yeah? And then, so this is R2K, so basically what I'm gonna do is the following. I have to show one minus R2K. R2K is the probability that uh, the communication with both my neighbors after K steps, R minus, one minus R2K is the node is not successful after K, yeah? Is that okay? So basically what you do is you simplify, 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 eventually you get this, okay? Uh, there's a little bit of manipulation going on. Since I have no time, I'm just gonna jump over here. And notice here, when you do this, eventually what happens is this, okay? You get this number here, two over two minus alpha, okay? If you look at this two over two minus alpha, basically that's what this number is. Oops, sorry. This number, if you calculate it, it becomes that, yeah? So actually we didn't first pick this number. We did that and then picked the number. It's go reverse engineering, that's what research is, yeah? And believe it or not, uh, when you're doing this algebra, many, many mistakes we made, okay? We make mistakes, we come back, fix it. Nothing happens just like that, yeah? So don't be afraid to try, just keep trying. Okay, it'll happen. So that's that. So we got that, okay? Oops, not there. Here. Why can't I go back? I'm going back. Okay, so we got that. And then we got this, okay? So basically here, you choose two such that, C2 such that this happens, okay? So basically, notice here, this is K, and this is the constant sitting there, and this constant C2 is based on D. Remember we had one over N to the D, you remember that? It's one over into the D, and the D I get to choose, yeah? So if I choose a big D, I can choose big D. Oh, I hate this stupid thing. Uh, if I choose a big D, basically the K will go up, yes? So if I want N to the D to go down fast, I have to go longer steps, yeah? It's obvious, right? Intuitively it's matching now. See the theorem, it has to match everything correctly. So anyways, that's what we did. Basically what we did was we 
took this, we massaged it, we got this k, and this is what this number is. I can always choose a k bigger than that, and basically, uh, this is what I did, okay? I said, hey, I want this, this guy here, because one minus this is this, and I want this guy to be less than one over n to the d. Then I took this guy, and I showed, hey, as we do this, it's gonna be one over n to the d. It's one over n to the, sorry, d plus one. One over n to the d plus one for one particular node. There are n nodes, so when you multiply by n, you get that, yes? Look, I haven't done anything. I took a beautiful, simple protocol, and I proved to you that after this many steps, okay, we would have successful communication between neighbors, yes? Okay, I have to do a little bit more work, actually. This one is basically, uh, this is the expected number of rounds I need for nobody to be, everybody to be communicating. That's what it says. Expected number of rounds to have less than one unsuccessful node. In other words, how many rounds do I need to go before everybody is good? So we define one of these random variables. Again, see statistics. There's no computer science now. It's done with one protocol. Okay. And then, basically, we can show the expected this is that, because basically, all what this is saying is the following, okay? This is saying, one, if node I received information from all its neighbors on node before step k. So this is basically saying, hey, if I am the node i, okay? If I've gotten everything from my neighbors, so in this case, only two neighbors, before step k or on step k, at step k, I'm one, otherwise zero. And obviously, if you compute the expected value of this, Basically, expected value of random variables, probability of success times the value, plus blah, blah, blah. It's this, okay, you'll figure it out. And then basically, there are n of them, so you do this summation. When you do the summation, notice expected value or random variables summation is the linearity applies. So you can push this, push this out, and then you do this and you get that. And then from there, basically what you can show is I want this to be greater than n minus one. What this is saying is, look, I want nobody to be left out. That means n is everybody, so I want to be greater than n minus one. So basically, I got that, and I simplify it, and basically, see, you get the b here, and blah, 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 and so on and so forth, I get this. I don't know what I did, I did these things too fast. All what I'm saying is the following, okay? After this many steps, okay, and after C to N log steps, okay, we have established communications with our neighbors, and also all the nodes have established with their neighbors. That's what this part is, yeah? Okay, and the protocol that we use was you toss, toss a coin. If it's heads for you, you transmit. If it's tails, you shut up and listen. How simple can that be, okay? So this is for the uh, line topology. Now, we're gonna, ah, this is, I put this down uh, just to show you, hey look, even the O-level mathematics is not dead, they are using it. This is basically, if you have something like this, I'll explain this to you. The maximum value of this is basically at this. So basically what you do is you differentiate B alpha with BP and set it to zero, you remember that? Yeah? Okay, that's what that is. So basically what we're gonna do now is, we had two, right, two neighbors. Now we're gonna have B neighbors, and B as a bound. Don't confuse this B with the other B we had, okay? So we have some bounded number of neighbors, and let's see what we can do whether this protocol works. That's all the rest to it, okay? And uh, basically when you take this, you can show it's less than or equal to one half, okay? And the maximum hop occurs when it's that. That's simple differentiation. So here's the equation for B neighbors. Don't be confused. I'm not gonna sit and go through the mathematics, but I'll explain how I got the equation, and then we show that this works. How many more minutes do I have? 15, oh my God. <laughs> All right, so basically here, um, these are the recurrence relation that comes for B neighbors. I'll explain this very quickly. So notice here, before we had two, right? Because we had two neighbors, yes? Now if you have B neighbors, it's gonna be B, yes? And the recurrence relations are these, and then here's a funny thing. Basically what happens is this recurrence relation, when you solve them, it'll satisfy this equation. This recurrence relation says, hey, after K rounds, zero people having 
uh, any communication is this, and so on and so forth. If you look at this, this is just the extension of the previous one, but we have B neighbors. And then we can show by double induction, actually, this holds, yeah? Okay? And again, I don't know how time flew. Uh, see all the mathematics, I'm not gonna go through. This is basically the induction hypothesis and blah, 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 prove everything. And eventually what should happen is this is, we, we get this, okay? We get this. So basically from these, we get this. All what this is saying is the following. This is, uh, alpha is basically getting communication from, one of the communication from B neighbors, and the reference relation basically established that, saying getting I after communication from I, this is the probability that communication from an I neighbors after K steps is basically like this. You get I minus one guys after K minus one and get one guy to communicate and this is after getting I after K minus one, get zero guys to communicate and so on and so forth and then you get this. And by the way, you go through this and then you can show we get something like this and then this is for B and what we do now is we lo look at a specific case for a grid, okay? Because these things are kind of abstract, yeah? So let's look at a concrete thing. So assume the things are on a grid, yes? Yeah? That's easy to, easy to kind of visualize. So it's something like this. Let me try this pen again. So the nodes are all at this intersection, yes? And if you look at this guy, he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight neighbors, yes? Okay, are you following me now? So again, we're gonna use the same protocol, right? Here we have a concrete example. You remember we P was some arbitrary P before? If you have eight neighbors, what the P value should be for the best uh, result? What do you think? So you have eight neighbors, yeah? Including yourself, nine, there are nine guys. And we're all tossing a coin, yes? And then if our heads comes, we transmit. Otherwise, we listen. What do you think the best value for P would be? Say it again. Uh, uh, that's how much? In that case, what? Uh, you're close, nine. Yeah. Yes? Think about it. So here, everybody has to talk, right? There are nine guys, yes? Okay, so basically, think about this. This is where computer science is really good. There are nine people. If everybody wants to be successful, all nine have to be e given equal chance, yes? Okay, so that's what the idea is. So basically, here are some numbers here. Remember I promised to show you that these are the numbers, uh, blah, 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 big O and so on and so forth? Okay, I'm gonna show you that here, okay? Uh, so here is what it is, right? Um, this is some theorem here, I have to go fast, I'm gonna go fast. I'm gonna show you the equation for the grid, okay? Here's a nine. See the nine? Yeah? So this equation is basically for the B, remember we had the general one, we just plug in eight, and when we solve, eventually we get this one. This is from the previous result, okay? And then we can show that, hey, we get the communication and the K is all again and so on and so forth. I'm sorry I'm going fast because I'm running out of time. So all what I've done is this, okay? We wrote a recurrence relation for line topology. Then we extended it to a B neighbor topology. Then we took a specific example of a grid and we applied that. And we have shown that after this much time, everything will be fine, okay? That's what all these mathematics, okay? All right? So. Believe, the, believe me, the mathematics works. Uh, let me give you some numbers, concrete numbers. So basically, okay, remember P, blah, 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 uh, the P is one ninth, yeah? The optimum value. So you have to, you know, just because theory proves something, you still, you know, when you take this and show it to these sensor guys, like the system guys, they want kind of validity, they want to say, hey, yeah, theory, but usually when you do theory, it doesn't work in practice, so show us. So we ran some experiments, okay? So basically, this is this many nodes, and we went up to three million nodes, yeah? Okay, so after this many steps, we established communication, and notice after three million steps, three million nodes, 
395. So this is 342, this is 395. A little increase and we establish communication. Look at this, this is scaling like hell. The algorithm is very simple. It's scalable, massively scalable. And it's done distributively, yes? Okay, and the other one, the pro remember the probability of s nobody having communication is this much, this is e to the minus 57. e to the minus 57 is zero, okay? There's no e to the minus 57. All right, so absolutely, absolutely, you know, after 3,000 steps, we have guaranteed communication, all of them. This is just for the neighbors, yes? And we have guaranteed communication for all of them. Did you at least see what I did, not the mathematics? And did you see the approach we took? And did you see the simple algorithm? You can do it. So your homework is to go home, think of a problem, Find some random protocol. By the way, randomness is better than, remember people check you at the airport and they have to do random checking. That's much better than profiling. You know, profiling means you say, aha, this guy is this race, we should check him. That's stupid. Don't, don't do things like that, okay? All right. Anyways, uh, next one is, this is the simulation on a grid network. Watch this, okay? We, for different probabilities. Again, the system guys will always complain. They'll say, ah, ah, ah. So we say, hey, you idiot, look at this. When you come to one ninth, we get the best results. Right? So this is saying for half, it's very crazy. When it's one fifth, right? You, you need for 100 nodes this many. But notice, when you have over here, this is the best value. One ninth, for everything else goes up. Everything else is up, yeah? So see, this is also, in computer science, teaches me real life, actually. It's nice to be, you know, everybody has to be equal. Then things are nice, yeah. All right, anyways, here's a beautiful, beautiful protocol. What time is it, Kasun? I got 10 more minutes? All right, so notice now, what did we do? We made this uh, uh, time slots. And these time slots can be spread apart, isn't it? Way spread apart, yes? Like, I can say you talk today, tomorrow, day after, and blah, 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 that's gonna take a long time. We want it short as possible, right? So how do you make it short as possible? So let's work with me, you can get it, okay? Think about this, okay? So let me try to draw. So here is, I'm not an artist, by the way, so bear with me, okay? Please forgive me. So you have nodes, nodes. I don't know, I can't draw with this pen. Sorry about that. Okay. So you have, pretend that there are nodes, 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 sensor nodes there, yes? So be very careful here, yeah? listen to me very carefully. When this guy is talking, these guys cannot talk, isn't it? Yes? Yes or no? Because when this guy is talking, if one of these guys talk, he's screwed. What else? Can these, can these guys talk too? When this guy is talking, these guys have to listen. So these guys shouldn't talk either, yes? Yes or no? Yeah? That's a key point. So how do you compress this? To compress this, this is what you do, okay? Basically notice, you have some number of neighbors here, which is eight plus one, nine total nodes and then you look at these guys, and that's what these numbers are. B is this many neighbors, yes? B plus one is including you, and the L is the number of neighbors' neighbors. Because when you talk in the middle, see, I, I don't want to point your eye. When you talk, in the yellow shirt, not only your neighbors shouldn't talk, the neighbors' neighbors shouldn't talk, yes? Because when you talk, your neighbors listen. If the neighbors' neighbors talk, the neighbors can't listen to you, yes? You get that, yeah? So how do you do this compression? So basically, now remember, everybody is doing this, okay? But we have now a protocol, which is a long protocol, where each guy is assigned a slot, yes? So that's there for us now, we did this. So this is what I meant by saying, first use randomness to get the fixed slots, and then again use the fixed slots, and use randomness to compress. That's what we're gonna do. See, randomness is beautiful. So what do we do? Each guy picks 
obviously his ID. Remember the N, the number of nodes, I said you have to hardwire it in. When you hardwire it in, basically everybody is given an ID. And the ID is basically log n bits, yeah? Because if you have two bits, you can have four guys, right? If you have eight bits, you can have two to the eight guys, yes? So log n bits is enough to identify each guy. So basically what each guy does is he transmits, he waits for his slot. You know, he's given a slot, right? He waits for his slots, picks one of these guys, time slots randomly, right? And then says, hey, he has to pick it randomly though. You, if, you, if you pick one, everybody will pick one, yes? Are you following me now? Because this distributed thing, protocol, so we are running this. If everybody picks one, everybody will clash. So you pick one of these things randomly, and then you transmit to your neighbor, right? So saying, hey, look, I picked this. And he also will get from his neighbors. Okay, so let's focus on one guy. Are you following me now? When this guy transmits something, other guys also transmitting back during his slot. There's no clashes going on. And then what you have to do is, so since this guy transmitted to these guys, they also got from these guys. Yes, what they have to do is they have to transmit neighbors, neighbors information. Because when this guy talks to this guy, this guy shouldn't talk, yes? So that information has to pass to the neighbors, neighbors, isn't it? Hello, are you following me now? You think about this, yeah? Yeah? So basically that's what happens. Okay, you transmit it, and then you transmit the neighbors, neighbors information, and then what you have is you would have gotten, so you transmit, you also would get information, and this guy will the next step transmit his neighbors information. So you, you sir in the yellow shirt, you are transmitting at the same time, the neighbor's neighbor's also transmitting, so your neighbor transmits, the neighbor's neighbor transmits, so eventually, sir, in the yellow shirt, you would have gotten your neighbor's information and the neighbor's neighbor's information. Can you picture that? This is the distributed protocol running, yes? So basically, you, at that moment, will know what slot you picked and also what slot the neighbor's picked, yes? If you have no clashes, you say the next time, hey, this is my slot. If there is a clash, you say, oh, nope, I can't do it. And then you pick another one and continue, right? That's main the idea is. It's very simple protocol, actually, okay? Compression. Go home and think about this. You may be able to improve this one, too. I can prove it works, okay? I don't have time. That's what this is. It's a beautiful, I mean, you can prove things once you do an algorithm. You remember the stupid Boeing company, the software, Boeing 337, or what, is, what the hell is that? 3737. It's still down. It's software false. They don't prove anything. They just write some code, change it, change it, change it. They don't prove anything, and it's crashed, killed so many people. We prove things. And this is a solid proof if you go through. It works, okay? Anyways, so far, I have delivered whatever I promised to you, okay? If you go through and analyze it, I have promised you, I mean, I delivered everything I promised you. I have a little bit more time. I promise to do the inverse problem. I'll tell you what the inverse problem is. And uh, stop me, uh, how many more minutes do I have? Can you give me a heads up, like two, five minutes before? No, 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 no. Uh, I'm from US, we don't take more than that. <laughs> time is valuable, everybody, see, I respect your time, and you should respect my time too. So at time, I stop. How five minutes more right now? Only five minutes more? Oh my goodness. Okay, so let me, let me tell you about this problem and I'll wrap it up. I was going to show you all this. This is actually beautiful. This was brand new, brand new, because we just published them in Netherlands about June 8th or something like that. It's an MAPSP conference, okay? So what this is is the following. I'll tell you what it is and I'll stop. I didn't know I talked too much. Basically what it is is you have a bunch of nodes, right? So you're sitting there, sir, and then you're listening, right? You're listening for the values. When you listen to the values, basically you don't get exact values. There's noise around it, so you get some value, yes? So the value that you get is based on a function f. So the values say you get something like x, so this is what you get, some value x. And it's based on some function v1, v2, up to some vb. And v1, v2, up to vb, including you, right? These are all your neighbors and including you. So this is the value sense is based on your neighbor's value and your value. So 
what you really want, the inverse problem is the actual value. Okay, it's very critical sometimes, because if you are doing some insulin monitoring or something like that, you don't want noise. You want to be precise. Okay, that's the inverse problem. The inverse problem is basically you are reading this, you want to get your actual value. So you know this function through experience, you'll know it. So how do you get it? That's the whole problem, okay? So we worked on that, and we proved some things, and uh, some of the stuff we cannot do because it's too complicated, because, but some, with some restrictions we can do, okay? And that's what this, uh, uh, where the heck is it? One second, okay? Uh, anyway, I don't know where it is. So if you impose some restrictions, like some, if the function is a linear function or something like that, then you can compute it. Or if the nodes are something like in a tree fashion, then you can compute it, okay? But if it's a grid, you can't compute it. When I say you can't compute it, it's NP-hard, NP-complete, and so on and so forth, okay? That's what these results are. And uh, basically, the other one I want to show you is the communication complexity. Communication complexity means this, okay? Remember, we are exchanging bit values, yes? We are passing number of bits. So if you want to make a chip, what you want to do is you want to minimize the wires. So you want to come up with a protocol which has the minimum number of bits exchanged. Think about this. These are all critical points, yeah? Because when you have more wires, the chip gets bigger and it's too complicated, too expensive. People won't buy it, people won't use it. So you want to make it as small as possible to make it fast, yes? So basically that's what the communication complexity is. Basically what it says is the following. What is the minimum number of bits that you need to exchange for the protocol to be successful? Protocol to be successful means Suppose, say, you're computing a function, say you're computing ands of all the bits or something like that, okay? One way to do it is you can send all the bits to one guy and he computes the and. Then the one guy is getting so many bits. The other one is you send one to the next guy, to the next guy, next to the next guy. Each guy can compute the and and send it to the last guy. So each guy gets only one bit, yes? So that's the idea. I think I'm out of time, right? Uh, I really, really thank you for inviting me. I had a good time. I didn't know I talked too much. Uh, basically, what this is is uh, not that difficult, okay? What's difficult here is the initial idea and then trying to get the right answer by manipulating these things and writing the right equations and so on and so forth. Uh, in computer science, okay, remember this, okay? You have to ask the right question. If you don't ask the right question, you will go everywhere and you'll never get the right answer. So always, you guys can do this, okay? Believe me, always think of some problem and then ask the right questions and solve it. I'm sorry I didn't do a good job, but anyway, I tried my best. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask me anything. <laughs>